So you are always being interviewed. being interviewed. Part of you're always being interviewed. There's a chapter in there called Personal, Personal Brand. Brand. Personal Brand, thank you. And so today we are honored to have our guest speaker, my good friend Josh Miles. And Josh and I have been competitors, partners, adversaries, teammates. That's not that's a, that's a strong word, right? <laughs> we've worked together, we've worked against each other, we've sold against each other, we've tag team projects. We've won business, lost business, lost it again, won it again, uh, many times over. And a good, good friend of mine helped us with our badging this past year, by the way. So Josh was uh, instrumental in helping define some of the digital storytelling badges. If you click through some of those, he was one of our contributors. So we're hopeful he comes back on the 24th for dinner with us and to spend some time. But he's also a speaker on the subject of personal brand. And uh, we follow each other on social media and so forth. And I said, hey, you know, it would be really cool if on a Friday afternoon you could come in and talk about personal brand to our students because you're always in you, right? So, and so my good friend Josh Smiles is going to dive in deeper uh, in that particular subject. Now, he has a new toy. <laughs> can, I, can I share your new toy? Uh, he, he just bought a drone. So he's been flying all over Carmel, taking cool pictures of Carmel lately. And so check out his uh, Facebook page if you have a minute. And so he has his new toy, and who knows where that's going to take you from there. So with that, Mr. Miles, it's all yours. Excellent. It's a pleasure being here. Um, so, you know what was really cool is like when I was setting up, there was like three of you in here, and then I turned around. Was it four? I don't know where you all were, but that was a unique trick. So, who in the room would like to define for me what brand is? The definition is this big. I want you to give me just a little piece of it. Who can give me a little piece? Who can start it? Brand is how people see you, your product, or whatever you are trying to sell. That's very insightful. Very good. Anybody want to add to that? It's what the business or you as a person do to make sure that how the audience, how how the viewer is actually seeing seeing the company or you. Yeah, so there's some intentionality about how you're being seen. Yeah, the iPad. <laughs> she, she said the story behind your product. The story behind, that's good. Good piece. What else? What else? This might sound a little weird, but it's kind of like the aura around you and the company, and just it's like if you walk in the room, the presence that people immediately get, and they they can see something and know it's yours or you right away. Yeah, about that. Um, there's maybe like the the slightly less shiny version of that is like just your reputation, what you're known for. Anybody else want to add to that? It's uh, when you think of said company, person, whatever, what immediately pops into someone's mind. Yeah. Just your off the cuff reaction to what that is. That's good. Did you have more? No. Okay. I, could, I felt like you were just itching, itching to add to this. <laughs> this is better than most groups that I get from like professionals. What can you say? <laughs> so here's a little bit about my brand, and I had, but I I ran a branding agency for 16 years. I was in the business of helping businesses and nonprofits, organizations from startup to enterprise, helping them tell that story, helping them intentionally shape how they're perceived. Uh, and also responding to how the market already saw them. So there are all those pieces to it. This uh, branding author named Marty Neumeyer wrote a great series of books. His first one was called The Brand Gap. And it was talking about the, this gap between the creative and the business side it was this thing called brand and they needed to come together to tell a story. Um, one of my favorite quotes from that book is he, he says, it's not what you say it is, it's what they say it is. I think that's totally dead on when it comes to brand. 
but there is this very intentional art of how do you connect that chasm? How do you go from like your reputation and then making it the thing that you want people to see it as? Does that make sense? So in this context of a guy who lives and eats and drinks and sleeps branding, I had this epiphany a couple weeks ago that I have been portraying my personal brand since I left my agency back in January as all the hats that I wear. As I'm a vlogger and I'm a podcaster and I'm a writer and I'm a speaker. Who cares? There's nothing that's unique or interesting about a list of your titles. This was my epiphany, was that, that my titles and my roles are not my brand. And, you know, never mind the fact that, like, that's not me. That's not who I am. My identity is not wrapped up in my vocation. But for, for 16 years, my role was so clear in running this branding agency that it, was, that it was second nature. And then when I left that role, it was sort of this void again. And it was like trying to grab onto all these things and hobbies. And I have a drone. <laughs> it's, it's not me. It's just a thing that I'm into, a thing that I like. So something I want you to take away from this is that your, your brand is something bigger than just the thing that you do. Your brand is bigger than a student. Your brand is bigger than an apprentice. Your brand is bigger than your part-time job. So my brand, as I've boiled it down, is really I have a passion to help other people take their creative obsession and make that into their profession. And that's the thing that I get wildly excited about. And if I go back in the Wayback Machine to sitting across the table from countless people that I interviewed in my agency, the thing that I was always most excited about was sitting across the table from someone who is talented and thinking in my head, is this somebody who's the right fit for my agency? And if not, who are they the right fit for? I referred way more people to go work other places than I ever hired. I think in total, I did the math at one point, I think it was like 50 different people who were in and out of my agency over uh, 16 years. We were a pretty small shop, so we, we could only hire so many people at a time, so there's no way I could hire all the great people that came to the room, but man, there were, there were lots of great successful people in Indianapolis that I helped guide them towards one job or another. So this is, this is really, I think, at the heart of, of what my brand is about. So when I think about the work that I've done um, in writing and the work that I do in speaking today, most of what I speak on today is on personal brand, and, uh, and I think it's because of this. So here's a little bit about, about who I am. You can decide whether this is my brand or not, but this is uh, my family. Um, just so you can see them a little more closely, these are my two ridiculously cute kiddos. There's no Photoshop there. This is <laughs> what they look like a person. And just when I, you know, start to feel pretty good about myself, I get this kind of thing in Starbucks. Like, it's not that hard. <laughs> Josh. And I just, oh, there's no A in Josh. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I would get so distracted with, like, I'm going to talk about digital marketing, or I'm going to talk about talent, or I'm going to talk about all these other things, and it's kind of like the Incredible Hulk joke, you know, that I'm, that I'm always angry. The secret is I'm, I'm always talking about branding. Mm -hmm. So if you want like the, the business to business version of Josh's take on branding, um, I wrote a, a version two of my book that came out last fall, which is Bold Brand 2.0 available at Amazon.com and other fine retailers. Um, <laughs> so this is kind of the in-depth soup to nuts, everything from how to position all the way through how to market your professional services, B2B service-oriented brand. Um, my role today, since I left the agency, I went to go work for a membership organization for which it was one of the largest clients that I worked for before I left, which is really weird to go from selling a project to consulting for this client to going to work for them. Um, I rode a moose when I was with them in Alaska. <laughs> it was a real moose. It wasn't a living moose. I rode it in Alaska, Alaska. So they ended up hiring me to be their vice president of marketing. So they are based, actually not in Alaska, they're based in Alexandria, Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C. And so I do most of my work 
remotely. So that's one of the other many hats that I wear. Um, I have two podcasts. One's called uh, Professional Services Marketing Show that I co-host with my friend David uh, in San Diego. And I have another one called Obsessed with Design. Uh, on Obsessed with Design, we interview designers of all types. So graphic designers, illustrators, interior designers, architects. If you have design in your title or sort of implied by your job, um, that's who I'm interviewing. And if you were a fan of especially graphic design, it's some of the some of the biggest names in the industry um, that I have just sort of fallen into <laughs> the ability to interview these folks. So it's pretty pretty fun stuff for me. Um, this is the thing I'm getting really excited about right now is uh, is YouTube. Any other YouTubers in here? Any podcasters in here? Yeah, sort of. No? Nathan. Yes. Okay. Any any authors in here? Yeah. Any bloggers? Okay. Good. good. Any tweeters? Tweeters. <laughs> Do we look like bird brains? <laughs> um, okay. Good. So this was a little. Um, I don't know what the music is going to do here. Will this play audio? Yes. We'll see. Volume's up. This will be the test, right? Yep. Not bad. It's good for the first time. for my YouTube series. So if any of that sounds interesting, check that out. That's at youtube.com slash Josh Miles. So that's enough about me. Why are we here today? What I want to go into next is, is Q&A, which is really weird at the 10% into the talk, but this is how I roll, so we're stuck with it. Um, we're going to talk about some things. Uh, we're going to answer the question, who am I? We're going to answer the question, what is strategy? We're going to talk about some strategies for standing out, and maybe we'll play with some toys here at the end. So, Q&A. What do you guys want to know about personal branding? Is there a specific type of font that's better than others? <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, other questions? <laughs> no, I should specify. I'm not ignoring his question. We're going to take all the questions first. Then we're going to make sense of them and answer them best possible. Yes. What are the best uh, platforms for entrepreneurs to get themselves out there on? Good question. So do you build your brand around who you are, or do you build a brand as you want it to be? In that video that you showed? Yeah. You had different like words on display and like uh -huh. different settings. Could you go a, a little bit into why you chose those specific oh, yeah. words? Uh, is it important to stay or do do stuff on social media in some regard for a personal brand, or is that something you can ignore? <laughs> what is the most underused yeah, utility people have it. for branding? Oh, that's a good question. How do you successfully change your brand? How do you know you successfully changed your brand? <laughs> <laughs> Who should how do you convey to your audience what your brand is? Like, even if you know what you are, how do you convey that to your audience? Like, hey, I'm different because. Do you have right for the writing? That was good, thank you. Who should have a personal brand? Oh, who? Um, as someone early on in my professional career, quote unquote, um, why should I care about personal branding at all? Okay. No, that's harsh. That was good. I was just going to ask him, what's the purpose of having one? <laughs> 
How does tone ins instigate your brain? This actually goes back to the fonts, but how do you use colors to effectively communicate your brain? It's a legitimate question. No, it is. It's legitimate, Is personal brand something that you just have to be, or is it something that you have to promote? Okay. What's the biggest mistake you make when you're trying to brand, and how do you avoid it? How do you avoid burnout when you're trying to create your brand in several different platforms? What are the best types of feelings or, I guess, vibes that you should give off of your personal brand? Really hoping for another font question. Is <laughs> <laughs> what is the what is the perfect resolution and size for pictures? Twelve point or fourteen point? <laughs> if they're working with a brand who maybe doesn't know what their story is, but they know what their product is, how do you find out? Like, what questions do you ask to find out what their story is and to find what they're trying to sell the brand as? That's good. Is there a reason you would ever want to separate your personal brand from, like, if you're an entrepreneur and your company brand? Mm -hmm. Is branding something that's for someone else or for you? In the sense that is it written for an audience or is it written for mm -hmm. you? <coughs> Are you actually live streaming this workshop? Maybe. No. Nathan's no, no. recording. Is this no. recording? Nathan's recording. Okay. Uh, started, I don't know. Started being live. There are things, yeah. <laughs> to an audience of one, yes. I can love you. To an audience of many, I don't know. Just record four. That's true. They don't give up. Any more? What is one thing that you wish people knew about branding? What is what one thing that you wanted to know about branding, but that you haven't learned until recently? Oh, okay. We can do all these questions. What <laughs> should you absolutely yeah. not do? Or maybe a top five of those things, because I'm sure there's more than one. <laughs> <laughs> and on the flip side, what are what is the one thing or two things or how many things that people should absolutely do? What was one of your biggest mistakes, and how did you overcome that and work through that? Anything else? The board of has How many days do you have? Right. <laughs> yeah. Did really. you number your, the questions that you have? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess you're just or was it just bullet points? Are you regretting that you came? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we're going to close the questions here because I've almost filled my tiny notebook. <laughs> uh, which is why I bring a tiny notebook, so I can only a lot for apparently 40 questions. Um, I'm going to write bigger next time notes. <laughs> okay, so the you guys have a lot of good questions and have demonstrated, it's already said, a lot of insight about what brand and branding is and just the fact that you're asking these questions tells me that you already have a good understanding of it. So so that's fantastic. I'm going to order, answer these in whatever order I feel like. So just throwing that out there. If I'm <laughs> skipping your question, I'm skipping all of them and picking the ones I want to answer first. Um, the number one thing. So as you may have guessed by the Hulk slide, I am a little bit of a like, comic book nerd. Not that I collected comics growing up. I just really like all the Marvel and DC movies, and I just sort of geek out on this. Um, the Andrew Garfield Spider-Man was not the most popular Spider-Man. However, I loved this scene in the Andrew Garfield movie, and I want to play this one bit for you. And I want you to tell me what line you think I'm most excited about. I had a professor once who liked to tell the students that there were only 10 different plots in Hollywood. Well, I'm here to tell you who's wrong. There's only one. Who am I? Mr. Parker, party again. Well, at least we can always count on you. Sorry, Mr. Ritter won't help me again, I promise. Don't make promises you can't keep, Mr. Parker. Yeah, but those are the best kind. Okay, 
class, open your books. Let's begin on page one. So give me a hint, those are the best kind, that's not the best. Don't make promises you can't keep. No. Who am I? Who am I, yes. The professor said there are only 10 plots in all of fiction, and she said, I'm here to tell you there is only one, and that plot is who am I? Which kind of gives me the chills every time I say that line, because I think it is so cool. I think. That is the number one most important thing that you can do for your personal brand. So self-awareness is a very difficult thing. And it's hard enough to help somebody else through it when you can see them from the outside. And especially looking at ourselves, it's kind of hard to see the label when you're inside the jar. Right? Like you can't get that outside in perspective. So taking the time to really think through not just how you want to perceive, be perceived, but how are you perceived, how do you want to be perceived, and really who are you. So, which, which I think lines up on the opposite side with the number one thing not to do, which is to try to make your personal brand out to be someone who you're not. So if it is not authentic, and if it's not a reflection of you, and it doesn't, it doesn't feel good, it, it feels like a mask, then it's probably not your personal brand, right? So one of the biggest challenges is, um, you know, you, you make some bad decisions or you, it doesn't have to be a bad thing, you do a certain thing for so many years and people assume that you are this person. Like you're in sales, you're a sales guy and it's hard to shed that salesman brand or you decide that you're gonna race cars so you're a race car driver you know like these are things that could be really tough to shed so it's about being very intentional in deciding how to tell your story so one of my favorite visuals for this is uh who's pac-man how many of you um have ever been to a networking event yeah, yeah, one or two. Um, so here's here's what we call in networking the classic show up and throw up, which is Pac-Man number one comes over Pac-Man number two and Pac-Man number two <coughs> says, so what do you do? Oh, well, you just wait. We do this and 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 this. And all Pac-Man number two remembers is next time I'm at a networking event. I am not talking to Pac-Man number one over the cocktail weenies because this guy is a bore and he's all about himself and he didn't even wait to ask me what I did. He didn't try to find anything out. He just info dumped on me the entire time. And his breath is terrible. And his breath is terrible because too many cocktail weenies. However, if you flip this thing, instead of hitting Pac poor Pac-Man number two with a wall, what if this is different? What if Pac-Man number two gets to go first? And he leads with the sharpest, pointiest, most memorable single fact about himself. And Pac-Man number one says, wow, that's, that's really interesting. I've never met anyone who does that before. And I've never heard anyone say that before. How did you get that idea? And so he can talk a little bit about that idea. Who do you do that for? I can tell you a little bit about it. And how long have you been doing that? And where do you do that? And what do your clients look like? And, and how do they like it? And what are you gonna do next? And he has the opportunity to talk about every other thing that he might have just shown up and dumped, but instead he invited a conversation. So this example is, is not just about networking. This is also, this is also your resume. This is also your website. This is also your social media presence. Does it lead with the single most interesting thing where there's hierarchy and it feels like this is the number one thing you want me to see? This is the number one thing you want me to get and it stands out and it's unique and it's different. This is where the importance of who am I lives. 
It's not in these things. It's like the epiphany that I had. It's not in my roles. It's not in the hats that I wear. It's in what's the most important thing that is different and unique about me. Does that make sense? Um, how do you avoid burnout with all the multiple platforms? Um, I think this goes hand in hand with the question of who is it for? Uh, is it for me or is it for an audience? And I think, who is your audience? Are, are you guys are always being what? Yeah. By whom? Everything. For what? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> but at some point we might want to dial it down a little bit further. But if we think about this in a professional sense, so we're talking about your professional personal brand, your individual professional personal brand, who is the most likely receiver of that brand? Who's the audience for that? Employers, right? Potential employers. Your peers, your coworkers, your your network, um, places where you volunteer. These are the folks that are most important for you to develop this personal brand. Does everybody need a personal brand? Does everybody need to stand out in the market? I'm not I'm not asking if everybody has a personal brand, but I think it's a matter of, to you of how important it is to stand out and be different. So if, if you want a job that's next up, next in line, and go do your thing, and keep your head down and do good work, then I think you probably get by without any reputation at all, any brand at all. I say that with a little tongue in cheek. Um, but personal brand is for people who want to go accomplish things. So if you want to stand out, if you want to build something, if you want to help grow a team, if you want to lead a team, if you want to lead from within a team, I think these are all characteristics of someone who should seek to build their personal brand. For me, one of the most important elements of building your personal brand is understanding what you want your body of work to look like 10 years down the road. So if you say, I want to be the kind of person who does this, and I want to be seen in this way. And you can work backwards from that and say, okay, when I look at someone that I admire who's 10 years ahead of me, and they've accomplished this, or they've done this thing, or they've written this thing, or they've worked in this kind of role, or they have this kind of position, they have this kind of authority, what are the, the proof points that you would need to get to that point? What accomplishments or certifications or experience would you need to hit those marks so personal brand is about kind of creating space in your in your life in your heart in your head to be able to go from where you are today up to that new spot does that make sense so when we think about who your audience or audiences are um, is anybody on blibber that's not even a thing, but tomorrow, like that could totally be a thing. You, know, you gotta be on Blibber, because everybody else is on Blibber. It, actually, it, maybe it is a thing, I don't know. But we can't possibly be on all the things. Is anybody, does anybody feel like they're keeping up on all of the social media networks and doing them all well? Does anybody in this room even still do Facebook? Have you ever done Facebook? Okay, okay yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> Don't lie, you're on Facebook. Um, we can't do it all well. You can't possibly do it all well. So I'm going to tell you the three that you have to do. Yeah, that doesn't exist either. There's, I don't have the answer for you. I will tell you what's most important for me and what's most effective for me. But that's for me. And that's for my goals. For me, far and away, the number one platform for me is LinkedIn. I have more contacts on LinkedIn. I get more engagement on LinkedIn. If I post something interesting with a photo or a video, that post stays for days and days and days and continues to get views. Um, unlike anything, like if I tweet 
and nobody sees it for the first 10 seconds, it's gone forever. <laughs> like that tweet's never coming back. Facebook is somewhere in between. Facebook might, might hang out for a day or so. But for me, LinkedIn is something that the more your network engages with your content, the more it kind of buoys it back up. So it's almost like a, like a beach ball at a concert. Like as soon as somebody else touches it, it's, it's back up, it's back up, it's back up. Now, there are other great platforms that will do similar things. One is YouTube. YouTube is the second largest search engine in the universe, owned by Google, who is the largest search engine in the universe. So the great thing about YouTube content is 10 years from now, somebody could be Googling, how do I blah blah, you know, fix my sink, and they could find a video that you made 10 years prior, because that thing's gonna live on forever, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but it'll continue to get search hits, it'll continue to get traffic, it'll continue to pick up momentum. Very similar to that is if you build your own content on your own website or your own blog. So any content that you build, that you own, that you can control, can continue to develop search traffic year after year after year, day after day, right? A tweet is not going to do that. A Facebook post is probably not going to do that. A LinkedIn post is probably not going to do that. You know, so they're all very different strategies. So if your if your strategy from a personal brand standpoint is to be Johnny on the spot and always commenting about the latest sports score or the controversial play, then Twitter and Facebook are great for that because people are looking at it in real time and watching things as they happen. But if you want to create a piece of hard-hitting research that people will find for years to come, then you want it to be on a platform where people will be able to find it later on. Does that make sense? Um, what is the best font? That was a brave question. Um, I, I think it's kind of like the best platform and the best colors. And there's, there's not, unfortunately, the correct font for me to use that's the same for you and the same for you. Um, however, I am a recovering graphic designer and I have lots of font preferences. <laughs> so I will tell you that my, my personal aesthetic, as, as you've probably seen from my slides, is just, just go to the next slide. Okay, it's clean, right? It's just very simple. It's not overly decorative. It's not. It's not difficult to read. It's strong. But those are all the things that I want people to take away from my brand. So maybe your brand is the same, and maybe your brand is more, more professional or more traditional or more. Times Roman. More Times Roman. That's right. Yeah. Uh, if you want to be more diminutive, you'll use all lowercase, like that. You know, that feels more approachable than all, all uppercase. We all know that from typing, right? Like, you all caps is shut up, don't shut up. But I, I think this is a good segue. So I think when we're talking about the right, um, the right colors, the best colors, the best way to use photography, the right platform for you, the right fonts, the right, it's all, it all comes down to strategy. And I, Maybe you guys will be really good at defining strategy because you're so good at defining brand. So does anybody have a good definition for strategy? A plan of attack. Plan of attack, that's that's good. Multiple steps. Multiple steps. Into your plan of attack. Does anybody else have a definition? Finding where, <laughs> finding where you want to end up. Finding where you want to end up, that's good. A plan for your goal. Plan for your goal. A plan on how to get to where you want to end up. How to get to where you want to end up. Um, this, quote is from Richard Rommelt, who wrote a book called Good Strategy, Bad Strategy, which sounds like a bedtime story. Um, and his quote is, a good strategy includes a set of coherent actions. Uh, I saw a woman named Christina Halverson, who's the CEO of a company called Brain Traffic, and she spoke at Content Marketing World a couple years ago in Cleveland. Um, and she was talking about how to visualize what strategy is. So if we think of this grizzly bear, what do you think his goals are? Dinner. Dinner, yeah, he wants to fill his belly. 
Why does he want to fill his belly? He's hungry. He's hungry. He wants to live. He wants to live. His goals are he wants to live. He wants to eat enough so he can hibernate that winter. He wants to go find mama bear and make some baby bears. <laughs> I mean, he's got some pretty, pretty basic noble goals. So if, if those are his goals, the, the underlying goal here is, you know, fill his belly, right? So that's, that's the goal that's in effect here. And the tactic that he's using is he's just chomping down on those fish as they fly by, right? The tactic is I'm going to go eat salmon because salmon are nutrient rich, great source of omega-3 uh, fat, right? I'm sure that's what he's thinking. I right? need those omega-3s. But they are dense, dense with great nutrition. So this tactic is fantastic. It's way better than foraging for mice and berries in the woods. Because you gotta eat a lot of berries and a lot of mice to get, you know, to equal one bowl of total. What's his strategy here? Wait for the fish to come to him. Yeah, his strategy is he has physically moved himself and relocated himself in a spot where all he has to do is hold perfectly still. He's gonna expend literally the least amount of energy possible to get the most energy possible. And all he's gotta do is wait until that fish comes right through his teeth and close down. That is strategy. However, it's easy for us, especially business owners. Business owners do crazy things. We look at what other people are doing and we try to emulate it. So we try to take somebody else's tactic and very similar goals without really understanding the strategy and it looks like this. <laughs> there is no salmon that will ever fly through his teeth. But that's what we do. So this is, this is strategy. Strategy is finding the thing that connects the goals with the tactic. What is, the, what is the best way? What is the smartest way? What is the right font to connect your goals to your tactics? What is the right color palette to connect your goals to your tactics? What is the right social media platform to connect your goals to your tactics? And then when you have a team that's working together all on the same strategy, that's what it looks like. Everybody gets it. Everybody's following the same strategy. So I want you to think about this for an exercise. Maybe you guys can do this um, after, after I'm long gone. But um, to think about your strategy. We talked a little bit about audience and goals. So I think it's important to think about what's that future vision, what are the goals, and then who's the audience for that? Does that make sense? So my vision is I'm going to have this future position where I'm going to be creative director of an ad agency in Chicago. And my goals are um, I want to learn all these things. So I'll have that, that skill and get those jobs that give me the stepping stone to get there. And my audience is really how do I get the attention of uh, a small ad agency here in Indianapolis or somebody that would be a good stepping stone along the way. So you're thinking about what's your present state? How many of those things do I have today? What's that future state look like? And what assets do I need to develop along the way, right? So we talked about that 10 years down the road, what's that future body of work? That's what those assets are. Those, those don't necessarily have to be things. They could be accomplishments, they could be certifications, they could be, I got to go on a photo shoot, there's a lot of, I got to work on this type of project, I got to work on uh, something for IndyCar, and so here's what this looks like. So for your vision, you have, here are my main goals, here are my audiences for each, and here are the assets. Does that make sense? Like that's kind of your roadmap for how to, how to develop all those things. A friend of mine on Facebook today was giving me a hard time because I was talking about priorities in plural, and he's like, well, priority implies that it's only one. So, so maybe you get down to the point where you say, okay, goal number two, that's really the priority, and that's the thing I'm gonna focus on. Does that make sense? So then you can think about this in terms of what you're putting out into the world. 
So whether it's your social media activity, whether it's your writing, whether it's video, um, whether it's your resume, whether it's your work product, we, but thinking about for your employer, what is it you want them to do when they see it? How, how do they react to it? How do you want them to respond? Is this, are these just proof points that you want somebody to be able to find, or is this something you want somebody to take action on? And then you map it out. So this is um, a consulting client of mine. For them, you might be able to tell their their email account, their MailChimp account, is kind of the, the brain of the strategy for them. So we're thinking through like how speaking gigs might come in for this guy, uh, and how we get to make sure these people are on his email list, and then what is it? What do they get after that? Email number one is thanks for joining, and email two is here's an example of me speaking uh, on YouTube, and example number three is you should buy my book, and example number four is something I can't read because my writing is that bad, and then the fifth one is you should not really hire me, and send me some money. So this kind of thinking through all the steps of this, right? So really understanding how you want somebody to interact. So I want you to guys to go back and, and do that on your own. So coming off of tactics, something we just touched on, I think the most underutilized tactic is email, which is like the least sexy thing that I could recommend. <laughs> For me to tell you that drones or video or podcasting or Snapchat, like those are all much more exciting tactics. But I'm here to tell you that email is quite possibly the most underutilized platform possible. So why email? Email is a relationship and a conversation. There is nothing that is far more intimate, and I say that not to be weird, but when when you I walk around with this in my jeans all day long, right? And I look at it a thousand times a day, and I'm constantly, constantly interacting with messages that come through here. Things that end up in my inbox that are not junk, things that I am actually excited to read and actually excited to interact with, happen with me right here. This is the entry point to get inside my head and inside my heart. So somebody that has a relationship with me might text or they might email, but they're, they're sending messages to me, and this is a very personal relationship, and it's something I can I can write back right away. You know, it's just just me and them. And developing that that email relationship allows you to create an audience. Has anybody ever heard of the, the concept of a thousand true fans? Yeah. Can anybody remember who the author is? Who? It's just you and me, so <laughs> it's fine. I don't remember. It totally escaped me at the moment. So look it up, A Thousand True Fans. And it's this concept that if you can actually develop a th not, not a thousand followers, not, not a thousand Facebook friends, not a thousand people on your email list, but actually have a thousand true fans, and you want to go launch a book, or launch a speaking series, or you want to, to do anything, to put research out in the world, you want to ask for people to help out with your nonprofit. You want to start a church. You want to, I, I don't know. So a thousand true fans is kind of this magic number where you have a lot of leverage. Email is a great, great way to build that list and create what are called CTAs in the marketing world, which is a call to action. So, which doesn't have to be salesy at all. It's just when you ask your true fans to do something, to, to like a post or to, help you with a thing, or to give you feedback, or to give you an opinion, or to weigh in, or to support you, or to help you when you're down, um, that's a pretty powerful driver. This is getting really, is anybody doing marketing email? Is anybody building their own email list? I'm about to. Cool, so just me and you. Um, some of the most important things for you to think about for email is making sure that you have a from name, which seems really obvious. But so when when I'm triaging email, like this thing fills up really quick, and I want to get it out of there really fast. And if I see your name and I go, oh, that guy, that's a good start. So then seeing the subject line is the second thing that I see. 
the subject line should not say October newsletter, ever. <laughs> because there's no time in history that I've ever opened my email and gone, October newsletter, that's great, I, keep, no, I don't care. It doesn't tell me anything. I want to know something exciting. So if it's something like why I joined Apprentice University, okay, that's interesting. Or why I think Josh Miles is full of crap, also interesting, <laughs> I'll read that. Um, but October newsletter sounds like every other newsletter that's in my inbox, so don't do that. And then there's this thing that you can control on most email services. And if you're not using a one-to-many kind of service and you're just literally sending an email, it's going to be the first line in your email. So again, you don't want that to be, um, if you can't read this message, view in a browser, because that's what it says by default in most of these email marketing services. Because again, you're just wasting an opportunity to get my attention. So have that be a payoff to whatever your subject line is. And then send an email that you would want to read. So the one that starts with October newsletter is probably the one that you don't want to read. That content is not very exciting. But if it's a think piece, if it's if it's demonstrating how you think and how you feel about it, <coughs> fantastic. People will want to read that. All right, let's talk about some LinkedIn basics because that's number two for me. Yes. So email is the least sexy but the most powerful. LinkedIn is the strongest for me. Um, first of all, just complete your profile. How many of you have LinkedIn accounts? How many of you have some work to do in your LinkedIn accounts? And that's fine because we probably all do. Um, step one is just make sure you're filling in all the boxes. I'm not saying make up stuff where you don't have things to say. I'm saying make sure all of the content that you have to add to the, to the profile is complete, um, that you have a nice looking headshot, and not that one where your arm is like cropped off and where you're with somebody else in the foot. No, not that one. Not the selfie, like an actual nice headshot would be great. Your headline on LinkedIn, how many people know this? Your headline on LinkedIn does not have to be your job title. However, when you add a new job onto LinkedIn, by default, it will try to take that job title and make that your headline. That's nice of LinkedIn, but again, it's kind of like you are not your role. Your headline can be something that sets you apart, that says something different, and it need not be your job title. As you know, you don't want it to say Josh Miles, intern. Even if you are an intern, they can go two clicks further and see your current position as an intern. That's fine. What, oops, what makes you stand out? What makes you different? My recommendation on LinkedIn, post one or two times a week. Just try it. Try it for, for two weeks and tell me you aren't hooked. This is content, again, that everybody who touches it, help your friends out. Everybody who touches it, that content's going to float back up to the top. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, with the caveat of include a photo. So if you've got something interesting to post on LinkedIn, find a relevant image. Go take a relevant image. We all have, like, super cameras in our pants. Just go find something cool. Use that blur filter, dress it up in Instagram, whatever. <laughs> post that with your LinkedIn post and tell me that it's not a miracle. Yes? And if you don't have anything interesting to say, is it like at a certain time to share something else? Somebody has maybe a comment on somebody else's? Thing? Yeah, that's great. I was going to say get a hobby. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. um, no, absolutely. Commenting on other people's stuff is is also very effective. So you're helping somebody else's content pop up, and people see the interesting comment that you had on their things. You share things. Um, this is a great way. If if you want to impress Ron, and you wait for Ron to post something, and you're like, Bing. That That's really yeah. Cool. And I loved how you said that thing. That was so funny. So and then. The next post, you say, bing, Ron, why did you say that? I'm, I'm really curious what you think about this. So what's happening? You're, you're creating this conversation now with, with someone on, it doesn't necessarily have to be on LinkedIn, but with whatever platform you want to get their attention, you know, you're short of stalking them, <laughs> sort of following them around the internet and trying to 
create some relationship. It's a it's a great entry point. Yeah. Um, how are we doing on time? We're doing great. Can we be more specific? I should have asked a more specific time question. Bye. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Great. Uh, do you guys want to talk about podcasting? Yes. Yes, please. Okay. So I have one podcast that I started and one that I adopted. So it was launched by a uh, an agency in Australia. And they had interviewed me for the podcast, and then they had interviewed me a second time for the podcast. Um, and they said, you know what? We're getting out of this line of business, and we think we just want to give it to you. And it just turns out that the organization I work for now is also in that line of business. So it made sense for uh, David and I to take that one over. However, this is about how to launch a podcast. This is not about how to adopt one. So if you're going to start a podcast, this may sound a whole lot like my personal brand uh, recommendations, but first of all, it's most important to find your audience and your voice. So if you go back to like 12 minutes ago, the least sexy but most powerful tool you have at your disposal is what? Email. email. Why is email so powerful? To create your relationship. Yeah, how do you create that relationship? Communication. Right? Okay. Yeah, you're sending them messages that matter. You're developing this ongoing relationship where every week or every month or every other month, you're sending them something about how you think and what you're excited about and what you feel and what your opinion is. Do you think it's going to be easier for you to launch a podcast a year after building that email list or before you build that email list? After. After. Why is it easier after? And you already have an audience that already knows your voice, and they already know, like, not literally hearing your voice, but uh, on a podcast, they're literally <laughs> hearing your voice. So great to have an audience to promote the podcast to before you have a podcast. Uh, and voice is not just about what you sound like, but also you had a question about tone. So like, how how do you talk about things? And again, not not what your tone sounds like, but you know, are you are you argumentative on your podcast, or are you um, do you sound like a psychiatrist, or are you you know interviewing people and kind of are you a talk show host kind of person? Or um, you know, do you bring do you bring guests on, or do you just have regular co-hosts and you guys get on the get on the podcast and just kind of talk about things or make jokes or have fun? So understanding kind of the format is. Uh, is my next bullet point that I stole for myself, whether it's an interview, monologue, or co-hosted. Um, don't feel like you have to do all the technical stuff yourself. I mean, you're going to have to pay someone, <laughs> maybe on Fiverr, on the cheap side, um, but there, there are people who will produce a podcast for tens of dollars per episode. You just got to go find them. Uh, if you want to do a everyday pod podcast, even 50 bucks a day adds up real fast. But um, but don't feel like you have to know all the technical ins and outs to do it. What I feel like you do have to know is what you're going to talk about. You know, get that voice and audience straight. Um, decide how you want the format to work, and then work with smart people. Maybe maybe you have friends who want to get into audio production, and maybe they want to produce the podcast for you. The entire room looks to be on Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. So produce each other's podcasts. Um, this is this is the most important tip that I think I have for podcasting. If you are going to launch a podcast, um, and the only way this doesn't work is if you're doing something that's super timely, like sports scores of the day, or reviewing this week's episode of Game of Thrones, or you know. Uh, or you're like launching a, a church service or something. Like the only way this doesn't work is if you're working with super timely material. So otherwise, launch with a stockpile. What I mean by that is the current belief of the Apple Podcast algorithm is that total downloads is the most important factor for them putting you up on lists and featuring them in their new and noteworthy sections. 
So if you want any chance of being featured, you need to get as many people as possible, not listening to one episode, but listening to as many different episodes as possible. So if you go to market with three podcasts and you have a thousand people listen, that's three times as many as one podcast and those same thousand people listen. If you launch with 12 podcasts, you, you guys can do the math. You guys get how this works. But having the exact same audience listen to multiple shows at launch is way more interesting to Apple than having your audience only listen to one or two. Does that make sense? I think I launched with like six episodes in the first two weeks and I wish I had 12 because I, I made it onto lists and I could have been way higher on those lists if I had doubled that, that entry point. Um, most podcasters quit, period. So if you get past three to five episodes, you have already done more episodes than the average podcaster. It is a, it's tough to keep going. You know, because you have to build up so much momentum before or most people have to build up lots and lots of episodes before they get thousands and thousands of listeners or can get sponsors or can actually make money doing it. So you gotta that's why building that audience is so important, building that email list first. So one of my mistakes, not launching with enough podcasts. Maybe not launching with a big enough email list. And I would say, don't let uh, great get in the way of doing a really good podcast. No matter how much you practice, no matter how much you tune in your audio gear, no matter how much you listen to whoever your favorite podcaster is and try to sound just like him or her, you will listen back to that first episode a year from now and go, oh, that was awful. It wasn't actually awful, but you will see how much you have grown in that year. So waiting until it's perfect to launch is really kind of a silly errand because you're going to grow so much just in doing your show uh, than you ever are if you just try to make it perfect before you go live. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Who has questions about podcasting? Yeah. Why would I podcast? Why would you podcast? Why would I want to do that? That sounds really harsh. I'm, I'm actually really interested, but like, I just want to know why. Like, sorry, that came out really harsh. No, I'm just so terribly sorry. There are, there are only like millions of podcasts, so this is not me trying to convince you to podcast. Um, so podcasting, let me flip this. Why would I listen to a podcast? How many podcast listeners do we have? Yeah. Why do you listen to podcasts? I really. I just something I discovered about myself is I love listening to people talk. Uh -huh. Especially when it's something that interests me or is that's funny. Mm -hmm. I just I'll listen to that. Yeah. I go to sleep every night, I'll pop in a podcast while sleep. Yeah. So it's me. usually like a nighttime routine for you? That and anytime I'm in the car, pop on a podcast. Yeah. Do it chores, pop on a podcast. Do Anybody have work. more to add to that? What what do you when do you listen to podcasts? Are you doing anything else? Besides driving or sleeping? The worst part of your day. Worst part of your day? Which is what? The most mundane part of your day. Okay. Like doing busy work kind of stuff? Driving, doing Driving. busy work. Uh -huh. Cleaning. Cleaning. Mowing the lawn. Mowing the lawn. Dishes. Dishes. When you literally feel like you don't want to do anything. Yeah. But you want to kind of be slightly productive. So you listen yeah. to something to learn something. <laughs> so you can feel good that you're not doing anything. <laughs> Yes. Not speaking from personal No way. No, just, just theoretically. <laughs> it's a friend. I had for a friend. Um, <laughs> asking for a friend. <laughs> so, did you notice anything about that? All of those comments? It's when you can focus on it. No, yes and no. Can you drive to work and watch YouTube? I mean, can. Yeah. <laughs> can, you, can you drive to work and read a novel? <laughs> yes. Can you can you mow a lawn and like type a term paper? Nope. Yeah. If you're the amazing part about podcasting is it's almost always consumed while you're doing something else, and it's kind of like listening to music, right? Like this is a brand new concept, but. 
but audio is awesome because you can pop in your earbuds. And I was listening to, uh, not a podcast, but I was listening to a book on Audible on the way over here at two speed because I'm crazy. <laughs> I just can't get enough information. So I will listen to it faster um, while I was driving. And while I was getting turn by turn directions through the same headphones on how to get to a French university. At 2x speed. Yeah, at 2x speed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And the, the Jeep was also at 2x speed. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's a big why people consume podcasts. So I guess what I'm saying is, is there is a huge audience out there of people who want to get something from somebody. They're going to find it somewhere. Do you want to be the voice that's sharing it with them? Do you have enough to talk about? My guess is yes. <laughs> so, uh, do you look at podcasting as a an entrepreneurial, whatever you have? Endeavor, or do you look at it as? I guess they're, they're kind of one of the same, but they're kind of different. Do you look at it more of a branding endeavor? Is it more of a thing you do so you can build a brand, so you can use that brand in other places, or do you look at podcasting as, oh, this is a good money making endeavor? You know, along those things. I think back to our grizzly bear, it's the strategy question. So it, it can be those two things, and it can probably be lots of other things too. It could probably be a business development tool. It could probably be a, you know, we talk to these people about these kind of projects because it's the kind of projects we do, and we want you to call us to do that project. Or, you know, I want to be a speaker or stand up comedian and so I'm going to get on the podcast and do comedy because I want people to call me up and say hey we're going to pay you 10 grand to come speak to our comedy club nobody does that but, um, somebody does that uh, does that make sense? yeah anything else you guys would add to that? why you go on podcast? no question. Your question? Mm -hmm. okay um, is there a difference in the way that you speak and communicate on a podcast versus if you're actually doing a live presentation or doing a YouTube video or just talking in a normal everyday conversation? Uh, uh, yeah, there can be for sure. And it um, depends on how much you want to edit. <laughs> you either get really good at just flowing on the microphone. I mean, rapid um, just like so you don't have to cut out the ums and haws and the pauses and the looking stuff up and the oh hang on let me get the doorbell like for me I like to have everything where I need it it's all within arm's length I've got my notes here I've got my questions here the mic is here I've got the mute button in case I need to cough so that there's as little editing as possible and how I want to chop that up um, but if you listen to something like um, 99% Invisible, does anybody listen to that show? Or, um, or Reply All, or some of these like really heavily produced shows where it's like somebody's giving a quote and then the producer comes in and says, that's Avery Troubleman, blah, 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 blah. And then they come back and there's another quote and there's a sound effect and then there's music and then there's like a pause with some stuff. Like those podcasts take days and days and days to produce. Some of them take months to produce. They'll do research and they'll go fly to Sheboygan to go interview the guy that makes the thing and then, you know, can take forever. So yes, there can be very different strategies. What kind of equipment and software would you recommend? Literally just about to ask. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're thinking together. Yeah. Would you recommend for people just trying to start up the podcast? Just trying to start. Mm -hmm. um, you can totally get by with a laptop and Skype. And there's, um, Skype may have this installed now but they, there's a plugin called call recorder it's like twenty dollars so there's also a, a free program called audacity that's fantastic yeah. so it depends on if you're talking to yourself or talking to someone else so on my shows i'm always talking to somebody else so skype connects me to that person i can record through skype i can put in my earbuds my apple earbuds that have i can hear and speak at the same time that's like the cheapest possible setup i think that you can do um, Taking it up a notch, there are a couple of really good uh, USB microphones. Um, and I've got a whole like collection of PDFs and recommendations that I've collected over the years. And if you want, I'll just share it with you and then you can distribute to the class. So just, just remind me to do that. I have it handy, I can just... Um, when you want to get up a little bit higher end, 
um, you could do like a USB audio mixer so that you can control some compression, control like just air and the like the hiss that you hear from different machines. The cheapest way to fix that though is just go in a room and turn off the air conditioning. So not having the noise to edit out later or to deal with your mixer or to deal with a really nice mic, it's so much cheaper and faster and easier to just not have the noise in the first place. Yeah? Um, I have a question, but I, actually what I wanted to ask on to this because I know that there's several apprentices in here who work in the like the up north area. <laughs> If you're really interested in starting a podcast but don't have money, the Carmel Public Library just created this digital media lab and they have a sound room with like two mics, an audio mixer, soundproof, no like room noise, it's weird. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all, it's all, if you have a library card, you can go. Yeah. You just reserve it by the hour. Yeah, you can reserve it for like two hours. So, I really? thought I'd throw that out there. I've yes. used it. But I did have a question. Yeah. I was wondering if you had maybe top three podcast recommendations. Mm. Oh, as in my favorite shows? Yes. Well, I've already mentioned two of them. Um, one is called 99% Invisible, and that is, that's the podcast that got me excited about podcasts. Um, and for those of you who do not know what it is, it's... Um, it is like the little design things in life that you might have never even thought about. So there, for example, the first episode I ever listened to is called The Octothorpe. And The Octothorpe later became known as the pound sign or the hashtag. And it was about how it originated and why there's a pound sign on the old school touch tone phones. It's not on the rotary phones. It's not on the dial, and it has made its way into lots of things in our culture today, but up until the touchstone phone, we didn't have hashtag, and we didn't call it hashtag. So go find 99% Invisible, look up the episode on Octothorpe, and tell me you're not hooked on that show. It's really, really fantastic. It is, it is a highly produced show, so the voices are kind of layered in, so it's kind of like a conversation, and it'll go backstory, and it'll go to interview, and they'll have great music. It's just very, very well done. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you like comedy podcasts? Or do you listen to any comedy podcasts? I don't currently. Okay. I've, I've tried a couple. <laughs> What's your favorite comedy podcast? <laughs> <laughs> well, I like the H3 podcast, but that's because I, follow, I followed the, the people who made it before they started podcasting, and now I just can't, I can't get enough. Um, this is really like a comedy podcast, but it's by a comedian. The Joe Rogan Experience, just, okay. it's an amazing podcast, it's probably the most popular podcast. Yeah. Ooh, I can't get enough of that. He is just, it's, it's daily, it's insane, and they're like three hours long. Yeah. So I don't know how he does that, but he just so much good content. I always love to listen to those interviews, really insightful stuff. Uh, so not my top three, but probably most, one of my most listened to is, is the Tim Ferriss show. I thought I'll listen to that, never listened to it though. And the reason it's not one of my top three is I felt like his guests have gotten more and more just out there. Where, where his guests from the if you listen to his first two hundred guests, they are all names you know, and it's it's amazing to hear this guy interview Arnold Schwarzenegger, or um, I mean he's just he's interviewed some really big names in all kinds of industries from. You know, film to business to startup founders to um, it, it's just incredible. And then I just I've just sort of gotten out of the habit of it because I just got bored with some of the topics there for a while. But um, have you ever done uh, hardcore history? Yes, that's another fantastic one. That is, if you want like a seven-hour podcast, to listen to <laughs> yeah. uh, hardcore it's history. Long. It is it is fantastic. As he'll tell you, he's not a historian, but he's a fan of history. And uh, it, he just makes history very interesting, yeah. which yeah. is an even bigger challenge in an audio-only medium. Yeah, the Easter Front one was is one I'm starting start to listen to. It's like what? I haven't listened to that one. Is that a new one? It's an old one. It's about the Russians versus Germany. Okay. During World War Two. I have. I have the not Eastern done Front of the World Oh, the Eastern World. Front. I thought you yeah. said the Eastern Front. I, like, <laughs> I, I have listened to that one. That's a very good one. So, 
Some of you might know Mr. Hilbert produces a podcast called Bottom Line Faith. There's some really interesting stories in there. Everybody listens to Ray Hilbert's work. Yeah. Lydia just fist bumped for that. <laughs> You're welcome, Lydia. Um, Reply All is my other, that's probably my most favorite podcast. Their tagline is a show about the internet, which sounds really generic, but um, like it's sort of the, the, the web version of. 99% of as well. So it's things on the internet and things that, like a little thing or a little website that created a big social thing or created this larger impact that you would have never expected. What's the name of that podcast again? Reply All. Um, what is my comment? I'm going to listen to number three. Hey, Brian. <laughs> Hi, Brian. Not. Uh, I've listened to a lot of the Abrams, they're not his podcast. Um, I think if I'm, if I'm being honest, my, my brother's a pastor in Granger, and I listen to his, his service, his podcast, probably as much as those other guys. Um, it's called Oasis Granger, it is where you will find his podcast. They're changing the name of the church to Influence, without the I, just the letter N, Influence. Uh, I don't think the podcast has an influence yet. I think it just says it's a scripture. So his name is Lucas Miles. And he also has a second show. He's sort of a, an odd duck, too, because he's a pastor and he's a film producer. So he has another show that's just called The Lucas Miles Show, where he interviews um, people who are in the intersection of faith and entertainment. So actors who are in faith based films or producers or um, authors or you know so um Hendrix brother the which Hendrix brother the guys behind the facing the giants I don't think they've been on there yet but like most of the other big films that are faith based like have that have hit the Hollywood um, yeah um he had uh and he had like Michael W. Smith on a couple months ago he's had like some some really big names so it's like it's super cool yeah i mean short of jesus but he had <laughs> he had jesus jim, on the show. jim caviezel was on yes. the show hmm. jim caviezel was on the show so he interviewed jesus um <laughs> and uh i don't know there's a there's a lot to go in so check out that it's it's fun listening to your brother on the radio um i did do that actually my brother used to Work the IWU radio station. So. Yeah, that's cool. Um, other podcast questions? Yes. Can podcasting be used to help like a musician grow in their program? Yes. That's a great question. Um, another show that I listen to is called Song Exploder. Anybody listen to Song Exploder? Yeah. <laughs> this girl. <laughs> um, Song Exploder, their tagline is something like where musicians take their songs apart and put them back together. So kind of most of the time the, he'll interview the musician and you never, he, you seldom hear his question. You just hear their story. So you don't hear him saying, and what was your inspiration for this song? You just hear her saying, Okay. My inspiration for the song was I was in a really down time. Yeah. Okay, so what our interview sounds like. Um, so you hear that through like, okay, and then I, I just grabbed my phone and I laid down this sample track and you hear like the acoustic and you know, they're singing in the bathroom and then you hear it. And so we went into the studio and we laid down this track and then we, we did this thing and so they layer it all in and at the end of the podcast they play the whole thing together, which is really cool. Because a lot of times they're like, yeah, we did this one thing totally didn't work, or I thought it was going to be at this tempo, and that was just the wrong tempo, and the producer said, you should try this, and that blew my mind, and, you know, so it's, it's really interesting, so there are good examples of musicians and podcasts being a thing, I don't know about just, like, just playing your music and making that podcast, yeah, no, that's what I, I, that's I mean, what maybe I mean. somebody knows of those, but I, I don't. What was that called? Song Exploder. Song Exploder. <laughs> 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 All right. Okay. <laughs>
for now. Um, <laughs> any more podcast questions? <laughs> yeah. This is my last question. Um, yes, you are at your max. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> no more curiosity for me, sir. Um, so let's say someone wanted to start a podcast. How would you even, how would you get, how would you get the word out? When you're starting a podcast, I feel like Apple Music or any other podcasting app, mm-hmm. they don't really have a way for you to branch out and to get your get your your podcast out. It just mm-hmm. kind of is self-contained. If people listen to it, they listen to it. If they don't, they don't. And that's kind of there. Yeah. So how do you go from, here's my podcast, to, okay, I want to get this into people's ears? Yeah, so um, short answer, short version of the answer is, I think that email list is, is invaluable. So... You've got 500, 1,000, 5,000 people, or 50 people that you can send them straight to Apple to download that podcast as soon as it launches. That's really helpful. So if you, if you don't have an audience you're already speaking to, it's hard to just get everybody to go listen to your podcast. And so develop the audience first. A podcast, in essence, even though it's free, is still a product. Yeah. So you're trying to get somebody to consume your product. You need to figure out who that somebody is first. The, the longer answer will be found in some of those PDFs that I'll share with you guys. So it's just um, some really great tips and recommendations for how to get stuff out there. Um, it's complicated. There's not like a really easy path yet. Um, where with Google and Instagram and YouTube, you can just pay for more eyeballs. If you want more eyeballs, pay for them. Buy ads. You want, you want a thousand people to see your video this hour? You can make that happen. You put your credit card in, hit the button, dial it up, hit go, thousand views. There's not a mechanism, not a great mechanism for that outside of advertising on other platforms for your podcast. So building the audience is really the most important thing, and hopefully there will be some other good tips on our other stuff. Does the same apply to starting a YouTube channel? It's a great segue. Let's talk about YouTube. You're welcome. <laughs> YouTube, you say? Why YouTube? Um, so this is the thing that I'm working on right now. And I will tell you, as challenging as growing an audience for a podcast has been, growing an audience on YouTube is even harder, which is kind of crazy. Um, so people ask me a lot of times, like, so should I put my video on YouTube or should I put it on some other platform? Like, Should I just, just put it on Facebook or should I just put it on the website? And it doesn't have to be either or. Like the thing that we, we talked about before is it is literally the second largest search engine. So no matter what you want to do with your video as your primary place, also put it on YouTube. YouTube probably should be the primary place, but no matter what you think your primary place should be, it should definitely still belong on YouTube. Um, YouTube looks at things like your subscribers, your watch time, and just generally engagement. So um, in, in a similar way to how Google rewards you for creating good content, and what that means to Google is when people search for things and they find you, if they click on your page and then two seconds later they're off of your page, Cameras, that's Google, I'm not that crazy. Um, but Google knows what the behavior is when you click and go and then come back. Google knows how long you were there. And it's the same for video. So when your video gets served up in search results and somebody watches the first four seconds and then they bail, Google knows that. And the cool thing is as a YouTube producer, you can look at your own stats and you can know that too. You can know that people typically Peace out on my videos 20 seconds in. Well, that's a problem. What am I doing 20 seconds in that's so awful that people people are bouncing? Why why are they leaving? Um, you can organize by playlists and topics. So similar to um, to Google things, you can create keywords and descriptions and titles. In in the name of the game, if I leave you with nothing else from a how to uh, uh, influence Google and YouTube is just consistency. So if you think about what's the thing that I want somebody to search for and find my 
thing, whether that's a web page or a video, that's what you should name your thing. So if you want people to, to search for and find you, how to repair 12-year-old Chuck Taylors. If that's what you want them to find, then your video should be called How to Repair 12-Year-Old, or How I Repaired My 12-Year-Old Chuck Taylors. And then when you upload that video file, that's literally what the video should be called too. And then in the description, you should not just repeat those words, but you should unpack what that means. I have 12-year-old Chuck Taylors, and I was able to repair them, and you came too, and it's really easy, and I'm going to show you the three steps for how to do it, just using super glue and duct tape. I mean, never actually done this. Um, so consistently creating all that content, and then you have a place to do keyword tags. Chuck Taylor, 12-year-old Chuck Taylors, broken Chuck Taylors, how to repair 12-year-old Chuck Taylors. So you're consistent with all of that content. Does that make sense? So then when the search engine, with pretty smart but not that clever, goes to find, to match up a video with somebody who searches that phrase, I guarantee yours is gonna be one that gets served up. And the more often it's viewed, and then the more frequently it's watched to the end, or watched in length, the more Google, aka YouTube, is gonna push that content out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Consistency is key. Um, like we talked about with the email, at some point in your video, this is your chance to have a call to action or CTA. Um, again, it doesn't have to be a sales tactic. Just ask them to do something. Subscribe. Yeah, make sure and hit subscribe. Hit that subscribe button. <laughs> hit like. Hit the bell. Ring that bell. Let's match it. Comment down below what you think about this. I'd love to know what you think. Yes. In you the do. comments, tell me. Yeah. Yeah. Hear what you guys think. Right. And pay attention to your analytics. Um, what else? Let me see what questions I have not answered besides lots of them.